Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Okay, there we go. Um, I'd like to invite people to take their seats. We are going to get started. Terrific. So my name is Winston C. Thompson. I'm an associate professor of educational studies and philosophy by courtesy here at The Ohio State University. I'm also a member of the steering committee uh, of the Center for Ethics and Human Values, which is, as many of you know, OSU's central hub for normative scholarship, respectful discussion, and interdisciplinary engagement on the ethical challenges that shape our university and the broader community. On behalf of CEHV and the Kerwin Institute as our esteemed co-sponsor, please allow me to warmly welcome you to one of our most cherished and prestigious events, our annual Distinguished Lecture in Ethics. This series brings to campus thinkers who have been influential outside of the academy, in addition to having made groundbreaking contributions to ethics, political philosophy, and related areas of focus. Past speakers have included Michelle Moody Adams, Miranda Fricker, Andrew Light, Danielle Allen, Elizabeth Anderson, and Amartya Sen. In continuing this very fine tradition of high caliber scholarship, I am delighted to introduce Tommy Shelby. Professor Tommy Shelby is the Cadwell Titcomb Professor in the Department of African and African American Studies and the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University. Professor Shelby is one of the world's leading social and political philosophers. His work focuses on Africana philosophy, philosophy of law, critical philosophy of race, the history of black political thought, and the philosophy of social science. His most recent book, The Idea of Prison Abolition, was co-winner of the 2023 David Easton Award from the American Political Science Association. He's also the author of Dark Ghettos, Injustice, Dissent, and Reform, which won the 2018 David and Elaine Spitz Prize for the best book in liberal and or democratic theory, as well as the uh, 2016 book award from the, from the North American Society for Social Philosophy. His book, We Who Are Dark, The Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity, was recognized as a 20, uh, excuse me, as a 2005 best academic book by New York Magazine and a New York Times Editor's Choice. It was also a book that, uh, I'll just briefly say, that I read uh, just after completing an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and it caused me to reevaluate the fact that I had moved away from philosophy because I, I now saw I could ask the questions I wanted to ask in the discipline. Um, uh, with Brandon M. Terry, Professor Shelby has also co-edited To Shape a New World, Essays on the Political Philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr., and with Derek Darby, uh, is co-editor of Hip Hop and Philosophy, Rhyme to Reason. And perhaps most prominent among his many accolades and accomplishments, uh, before joining Harvard in the year 2000, uh, Professor Shelby was a member of the philosophy department here at The Ohio State University. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming this year's distinguished lecturer in ethics, Professor Tommy Shelby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Thompson, for that really warm and way too generous <coughs> introduction. I appreciate it. I um, also want to thank the, the center for Ethics and Human Values and the Kerwin Institute for, for having me here, uh, particularly here at o OSU where I uh, got my professional start now some uh, more than 23 years ago, I guess, a while ago. So it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all this morning. It won't surprise you that I um, uh, have some experience with racial stereotypes, so I'm gonna give you an example. So one evening a few years ago, I was returning to my hotel room after giving a lecture at a college at a small, uh, in a small suburban town in Pennsylvania. So I think it was maybe nine o'clock uh, at night, and I, as I walked up the stairs, I could hear uh, uh, a woman saying goodnight on a phone call and maybe standing on the landing. 
And so as I reached my floor, the woman, white, middle-aged, began walking towards the rooms off the hall. She frankly looked afraid, glanced over her shoulder at me. So in response, I sort of slowed my pace, walking several steps behind her down the corridor, mainly looking at my phone. Now as it happened, I was staying in the last room on the right. Now I don't know which room was hers, because she kept walking, and then almost running, straight through the door marked exit at the end of the hallway. With the door ajar, she turned abruptly to see what I would do next. Our eyes met briefly, then I opened the door to my room and entered. Now, I don't know exactly what the woman was thinking. She obviously thought I was a threat of some sort. I don't know why. I wondered whether I should feel aggrieved in some way, um, whether she'd wronged me and how she responded. And I, and I also questioned my own conduct in this case. Had I reacted as I should have? Should I have said something to her? And if so, what? What should I have said? And I've often thought back to that evening, to the woman's fear, to how I responded or didn't respond to it uh, as I worked through the ideas um, in this lecture. So my goal today will be to examine what makes racial stereotypes wrongful. I'm going to say at the outset that I think there are many uh, different types of wrong related to such stereotypes, and some of these are, are obvious, as you'll see, and some of them, I think, are a bit more subtle. I should also say that I think that the wrongs that are often associated with racial stereotypes, at least some of them, are not, in fact, wrongs, and I'll try to point that out as well. A stereotype is a belief about a socially salient group where the belief takes the form of a generalization. The term stereotype, as you know, has a negative connotation. To call a belief a stereotype is typically to criticize the belief in question. We can think then of stereotypes as a kind of faulty group generalization. However, not all group generalizations commit epistemic errors or are morally bad in some way. Not even all generalizations about racial groups. Considered a belief widely held and, well, and I think well known to be true, that black Americans generally prefer Democratic candidates to Republican ones. Now, maybe we might want a value neutral term to mark the relevant kind of belief, and if so, we might use the language of demographic generalizations. So to think demographically is to think in terms of groups, right? the similarities and differences between them and how they change. And that kind of thinking can be done well and it can be done poorly. I think it also has some real dangers, but I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with such thinking. Yet consider three familiar generalizations about black people that are widely thought to be quite deeply morally problematic. Blacks are dumb, blacks are lazy, and blacks are violent. Now I've expressed these generalizations in their most offensive form, that is as generics. Generic statements, they lack uh, explicit quantifiers like all or most or the disproportionate number of and so on. The three statements also have sort of vague and really highly emotive predicates. So without greater specification, it can often be really difficult to tell uh, just what a person who says these things, what they think. It can be difficult to know what makes them true. It can be difficult to know what evidence would show them to be true or what evidence would even would disprove them. Stereotypes are often best interpreted as probabilistic generalizations rather than, say, categorical generalizations. For example, they might be beliefs about what most people are like in a group instead of what all members are like. These generalizations are also often comparative in nature. For example, that the trait is more prevalent in the group than, say, comparable groups. Sometimes a stereotype posits that there is something in the intrinsic nature of the group that causes, say, most of its members to have the attributed trait. Sometimes the stereotype is best understood as attributing a kind of arresting intrinsic trait to the, to the group. Right? So for instance, uh, one that immediately elicits fear. 
which is compatible, as it turns out, with thinking that only a small minority actually exhibits the trait. It's possible for demographic generalizations to be empirically sound and yet an inference about a group member that relies on that generalization could be faulty or morally troubling in some way. For example, one might hold accurate beliefs about differences in crime rates among racial groups, but then wrongly infer from these statistics that a black person with whom you're interacting is a criminal. There's a significant difference between forming beliefs about a group and forming beliefs about, individual, about individuals based on beliefs about the group to which, say, an individual belongs. So with that kind of difference in mind, we might distinguish between a stereotype and stereotyping. So a stereotype then is a faulty belief about the prevalence of a trait in a group. And here the fault's gonna lie with the generalization itself, quite apart from its application to particular individuals. But we can think of stereotyping as a faulty inference about a particular person based on a group generalization. The stereotyping could of, could of course be doubly in error, right? It can be the case that it's a faulty inference that's based on a faulty generalization. So stereotypes exist as a kind of social fact, a cultural inheritance within a particular society. People are aware that generalization is widely held or at least was one, once was widely held and they know that others are similarly aware of this fact. When people express worries about actions or attitudes that say perpetuate a stereotype, what's well, these kind of commonly held demographic generalizations that they, about socially salient groups that they have in mind. So this lecture is really about stereotypical beliefs. Uh, sometimes a person may invoke or they might exploit a stereotype without actually believing the generalization in question. Why do they do that? Well, maybe to insult others, maybe to advance a political goal, maybe to tell a joke, or maybe just to be provocative. But what I'm really interested in here are those cases where the demographic generalization is sincerely held. So before moving on, I wanna just note briefly that a lot of the work on stereotypes in psychology and philosophy focuses mainly on implicit bias. So stereotypes and stereotyping, as I've here been defining, it, um, defining them, um, and implicit bias, these are clearly related, um, but I think they're different. So there's a sort of conceptual, and I would want to insist a moral difference between one, believing that people in category C have trait T, and two, associating people in category C with trait T. Unlike conscious beliefs, an implicit association is automatic, it's unintentional, it's typically not accessible to introspection. These implicit associations don't have the kind of normal propositional structure of beliefs and so are neither true nor false. Stereotypes and stereotyping should be distinguished from group prejudice. Prejudice involves having unwarranted hostile sentiments toward a group, like fear or contempt or resentment. Now where there's prejudice, there is usually corresponding uh, stereotypes present too. But I think you can accept a stereotype without having hostile attitudes toward the group in question. Now, this is obviously true in the case of positive stereotypes, for example, that blacks are good at dancing. Yet it can be true of negative ones too, I think. For instance, the belief that blacks are in, uh, not as intelligent as whites or Asians needn't lead to animus toward blacks. I'll return to that example in a moment. One can be hostile toward a group and rationalize that hostility with a derogatory generalization about the group. Right? This is common, right? Familiar pattern. Right? To attempt to justify the negative sentiments with generalizations about the group that make the sentiments appear warranted. In these kinds of cases, the stereotypes are not the basis for the hostility. Really something else is, right? Maybe the hostility exists because of some other, maybe unacknowledged trait of the group. Perhaps it's mere envy. The group could just be the target of displaced anger, and so on. However, I think there is a sort of gray area between stereotypes and group prejudice worth mentioning 
Some stereotypes imply a, a, a negative assessment of a certain sort. Right? For instance, when an unflattering character trait is attributed to the group, say like an unwillingness to work hard, that can look a lot like prejudice. This is an unfavorable judgment, and such judgments are typically accompanied by at least sort of mild negative feelings toward the group. Yet I still want to say that, that there's a difference between the negative judgment and any negative sentiments of hostility. Right? Um, even if in practice it can be difficult to, to tell them apart. <clears throat> so, so far what I've, I've mainly used uh, racial stereotypes as examples. The, uh, I still want to draw your attention to the fact that the conception of stereotypes I've been outlining is not really unique to race-based generalizations. Other group stereotypes are going to have these features too. Might, um, but a question here might naturally arise about whether there's anything sort of special or distinctively wrong about racial stereotypes. So one thought you might have is that racial stereotypes are wrong only when they are racist. And then the fundamental task would be, say, identifying what makes something racist, right? Uh, whether it's a belief or an action or an institution or whatever. And I've done a lot of work on that sort of question about what makes something racist. And what I really want to do here today, though, is, is kind of put aside the question of whether such stereotypes um, should be considered racist. And I also want to put aside whether uh, a person who believes a stereotype is a racist. Uh, and instead, what I'm going to do is try to focus my attention on how stereotypes constitute wrongs and with what stereotyping says, say, morally speaking, about those who engage in it. Now, one could argue, as Anthony Appiah has, that all beliefs about so-called racists are flawed because they presuppose the false doctrine of racialism. So in this kind of account, all, stereo all racial stereotypes are inherently flawed because there are no races. However, I, th I think it's a, a person can believe a racial stereotype without believing racialism. They might accept that there are groups whose members share a racial identity, as, as, as uh, Anthony Appiah has also argued. Um, but what's more, there are a, a number of influential scholars and intellectuals who deny that there are racial essences, but they believe versions of each of the black stereotypes are offered as examples at the beginning. These writers are content to say that while there are no racial essences that all members of a race possess, there are racial populations, Africans, Europeans, Asians, and so on, who have been reproductively isolated in the distant past and have different frequencies and incidents of socially relevant traits and tendencies, including with respect to cognitive ability, motivation for hard work, and violence. And let me turn to what's morally objectionable about stereotypes. Now, I want to emphasize at the beginning here that the most serious moral concerns about racial and other stereotypes have less to do with the beliefs themselves and more to do with the potentially harmful downstream practical effects of people believing these faulty generalizations. The people who accept these stereotypes might be led to act on them in ways that harm others. Those who believe these stereotypes might develop unwarranted hostility or contempt or disdain for others, sometimes contrary to the goodwill our fellow human beings are generally due. If these beliefs are widely held, this might bring about or reinforce grave social injustices that we're all aware of. And these are all pot potential harmful consequences of stereotypes. Indeed, mere implicit bias can have many, if not all, of these negative social consequences. Now, I take it that this much is, is clear and, and widely acknowledged. Less obvious is whether those who accept stereotypes do wrong or exhibit a moral vice simply in virtue of believing such things. Now, no doubt we sometimes infer that a person has a character flaw from the fact that they accept a particular stereotype. Maybe their endorsement of a demographic generalization suggests that hostility grounds the belief rather than, say, pure epistemic error. But what I'm talking about here are whether believing a proposition can itself uh, be a type of wrong. The question, I think, is worth exploring, as many seem to think that stereotypes are in themselves wrongful. That is, to believe them is to make one a fit target 
for moral disapproval, for blame, maybe resentment. Now, this kind of inquiry might immediately give some people pause. Why? Well, it can sound a lot like an investigation being carried out by the so-called thought police. Right? The moral condemnation of racial generalizations can seem illiberal, maybe treating controversial beliefs about race as like a kind of heresy. Such strong moral disapproval can be a way of morally shaming those who depart from some presumed orthodoxy simply because they think for themselves. And such condemnation raises the specter of aggressive, even state-sponsored suppression of unwelcome ideas, which would be a violation of freedom of conscience, conscience and expression. These kind of worries, though I sometimes overblown, I think do have merit. And we should definitely keep them mind, in mind as we proceed. Now, I take it that when something's morally wrong, this is a strong, generally overriding, if not decisive, reason not to do it. And I think that for a stereotype to be morally wrongful, the belief in question must be epistemically flawed in some way. It's false, it's misleading, it's inaccurate, unjustified by available evidence, and so on. Now, there are philosophers who reject this condition. They maintain that even a true or empirically well-grounded stereotype can be wrongful. And I'm not going to take the time to kind of argue against that view. Um, I'll simply note that I'm doubtful, at least, that my possession of knowledge could wrong others. Nor can I really accept that I have a duty to disbelieve something that I know to be true. Yet even if stereotypes always involve a cognitive bias or epistemic error, when persons are reproached for holding a stereotype, they are generally being morally criticized. The criticism is not just that they believe something false or that they have accepted a belief with insufficient evidence. We're all fallible knowers, right? We believe a lot of false things on shaky evidence. And this generally doesn't, nor should it, elicit a kind of moral reproach or indignation. So when, if ever, are stereotypical beliefs an apt object of moral evaluation? Suppose a white high school teacher, let's call her Ms. Johnson, has the belief that blacks are less intelligent than whites and Asians simply as a matter of cognitive ability. But instead of having contempt for black children, Ms. Johnson makes every effort to ensure that all her students realize her academic potential, even if that means she must provide extra help, attention, and encouragement. Ms. Johnson does not believe that more intelligent people deserve greater praise or reward simply for being smart. Nor does she think that a person's moral worth varies with their level of intelligence. Ms. Johnson does not tell her students about her beliefs on race and intelligence because she knows this would not only elicit outrage, but in fact would be counterproductive to their learning. So how should we assess morally assess Ms. Johnson for holding the racial stereotype. So let's suppose the comparative generalization about racial differences in intelligence is factually incorrect or lacks empirical support. Despite this, I don't think that the mere acceptance of the inaccurate generalization wrongs anyone. To see this, and I think I uh, hope to better understand why some people might think otherwise, I want to examine this, this case a little bit more closely. One more problem arises when a belief of the sort Ms. Johnson accepts is joined with other attitudes and moral principles, which then as a kind of ideology can seem to justify what is in fact unjust or otherwise wrong. It's objectionable to hold the belief only when it's combined with a wider set of beliefs and values. After all, some people are, I think, more intelligent than others, and this more general belief about the variability in, of intelligence doesn't generally cause much moral concern. And as noted earlier, group generalizations, though I no doubt fraught with great danger, are not intrinsically wrong. Rather than object to the mere fact that Ms. Johnson holds this belief, one could object to the way she holds it if, say, she's dogmatic in her belief, 
and say refuses to consider any contrary evidence, then her belief could be thought wrongful or to reveal a kind of moral vice. But if she's open to reconsidering her belief and say willing to seriously countenance counter evidence, then you might think her belief, though perhaps false and still unjustified by the available evidence, would not be wrongful and not a sign of a moral vice. In his, in, in his insightful analysis, Lawrence Blum, he focuses on this particular dimension of, of stereotyping. He argues that when a person is in the grip of a stereotype, they tend to resist evidence against the generalization. They hold the generalization in a kind of fixed and rigid way. They don't appropriately update their beliefs in light of contrary evidence. This, he maintains, is a critical difference between stereotyping a group and merely making a false generalization about it. Now, on this kind of account, the flaw is not in the belief per se. The moral failing is in the person who believes it because of the way the belief is held. Now, one reason to focus on sort of evidence resistance here is that it could be a mark of, uh, of wrongful stereotyping um, of the sort that uh, uh, Gordon Alport, Alport uh, emphasizes. It's a reliable sign of prejudice. These could be, that is, of antipathy for the group, which to generalization in this case is merely doing the work of rationalizing. So it's not the stereotype that produces the hostility in this case, right, but the hostility that engenders the stereotype. But even if Ms. Johnson is rigid in her beliefs about race and intelligence, I'm not sure that prejudice is um, the only explanation, or in this case, not the explanation, because as I mentioned, she doesn't have animus toward her black students. Right? On the contrary, she actively tries to promote their welfare. Now, if Ms. Johnson is, say, emotionally invested in seeing white people as intellectually superior to black people, well, this, of course, could lead her to maintain her belief uh, in the stereotype, even in the face of strong contrary evidence uh, um, that, she's, that, that, that she's aware of. This disreputable motive would be a sufficient warrant, I think, to condemn her for embracing the stereotypical belief. However, Ms. Johnson, recall, does not think that people merit praise or reward for being smarter than others. If the way she holds her belief is wrongful, then I think it has to be for some other reason. So prejudice and ethnocentrism are not the only explanations, though they are among the explanations, for why some handle relevant evidence poorly. There are other forms of what psychologists call, say, motivated reasoning. This is biased reasoning, typically unconscious, that leads persons to stubbornly embrace particular conclusions. People can be reluctant to change their minds if a new conclusion will be experienced as unpleasant or dissonant in some way. For instance, the new conclusion might threaten their self-image, or maybe it threatens the legitimacy of their lifestyle. There's also, of course, confirmation bias tendency to process new information in a way that favors one's pre-existing beliefs. Merely admitting that one was wrong can be experienced as unwelcome dissonance and so can lead to evidence resistance. So what should we think about racial stereotypes held because of the influence of mundane cognitive biases of this sort? Well, obviously once made aware of such bad habits of mind, we should be on the lookout for them in ourselves, right? We should attempt to correct for them. We should do our best to be dispassionate and impartial when we're assessing evidence that might contradict what we all are already inclined to believe. We should avoid being dogmatic, right, and try to cultivate a disposition to open inquiry, and so on. Now, these kinds of norms are what some people call the ethics of belief. They are among our responsibilities as knowers, and these norms are, I believe, especially relevant when it comes to stereotypes. Whatever norms constitute the ethics of belief, they do not require, at least on my view, that one believe any particular factual proposition. They certainly don't require that one believe something that one knows to be false or that one disbelieves something one knows to be true. There's no assumption here that one can believe at will. Rather, these norms require that one cultivate certain habits of mind 
a discipline, carefulness when forming beliefs, engaging in inquiry, making logical or causal or statistical inferences, and weighing evidence and arguments. Now, some would say that accepting and abiding by such norms, just, that's just what it is to be rational. Others might insist that observing these norms is a kind of self-regarding virtue, and right? it's a way of sort of avoiding living a life in bad faith. And perhaps these claims are true. But I, what I'd like to, uh, to endorse, well, I mean, uh, I, I, I want to endorse the compliance with these sorts of norms, these ethics of belief, um, for another reason. And that's because I think that these are things that we, these, that compliance is something I think we, we actually owe other people. I think in a democracy, it's reasonable for citizens to expect their co-citizens to take due care in the formation and upkeep of their beliefs about matters of public concern. This kind of epistemic responsibility is like the expectation that each of us acquire an education at least up to a certain level and that we sort of stay informed about public issues. As democratic citizens, we make decisions together about our common life and laws. And these decisions have quite far-reaching consequences for everybody who lives in the polity. And in fact, they often have such consequences for many people who live outside it. These are going to be better decisions. I think they'll be more rational decisions and better informed by the facts if people handle inquiry and evidence responsibly. So the ethics of belief is not merely a matter of rationality, nor is it, I think, purely a self-regarding virtue. Some dimensions of the ethics of belief are a matter of civic virtue, if you like, and political ethics. These and similar norms are what I'm here calling the political ethics of belief. <clears throat> so I focused on potential moral objections to accepting stereotypical generalizations about racial groups. And such generalizations can be empirically flawed in lots of different ways, even when um, not categorical, but merely probabilistic. A comparative generalization of the sort that Ms. Johnson accepts, remember that blacks are less intelligent than whites and Asians, can of course be false, it can be misleading, it can be unsupported by available evidence. But even if there were a version of the generalization that had empirical support, the application of the generalization to specific persons would raise moral concerns. That is, stereotyping individuals could represent moral wrongs that can't really be just reduced to moral objections against stereotypes as a kind of demographic generalization. So we should look to the inferences that Ms. Johnson might make about her black students from, mere, from her more general beliefs about racial differences in intelligence. Again, such inferences are often epistemically unjustified. Reasoning from group traits to individual traits, this is a rather perilous thing to do. It's beset with numerous pitfalls. For instance, Ms. Johnson might conclude from relatively small differences in average test scores that her black students have very limited cognitive ability, or that every student in her class is less, in, every black student in her class is less intelligent than every white or Asian student. Now these inferences would not be valid even if her more general belief were true. But is the fact that she might arrive at a false or inaccurate belief about an individual the only problem here? Whatever gener group generalizations we accept, appropriately recognizing the possibility of being wrong about a particular person in the group, I think is imperative. Such recognition affords members a sense of individuality, um, and this is something we all have reason to, to want. Uh, we have reason to resist being submerged in a kind of sea of generalities, reduced to the social categories to which we belong. And this needn't be because <clears throat> we somehow see ourselves as exceptions, and needn't be because we don't have a strong identification with the group we belong to. We might. Um, when we use the heuristics that demographic generalizations provide, there is this tendency, I think, to imagine that group members are much more similar than they are. And I think we need to be on the guard against the cognitive bias of viewing group members as, say, interchangeable or homogenous. 
And I think that too has to be a part of the political ethics of belief. Nevertheless, Ms. Johnson could fully recognize the individuality of her black students and yet conclude from statistical data on race differences and in intelligence that they have some cognitive deficiencies. Now it might help if we look at things from the perspective of the black students in Ms. Johnson's class. If they knew her views, would they have grounds for thinking that Ms. Johnson wrongs them in virtue of what she believes about them? Now she clearly could wrong them because of how she acts toward them in light of what she believes about their ability. Right? They might also blame her for any unwarranted negative attitudes that she might have toward them, maybe contempt or condescension. And the students could morally object to the irresponsible way she holds her belief, if say she holds the belief dogmatically in an uncritical way. But there's still the question of, does her mere belief about their ability wrong them? And so to try to sharpen the issue a little bit more, <clears throat> I think I'd like to distinguish two different senses of belief. So to accept a proposition P is to take P for granted in reasoning and practical deliberation, and to have dropped not P from active consideration. Belief as acceptance is a disposition to think and act as if P were a subtle question. It's kind of an all or nothing of matter, right? The believer has come to a definite and confident conclusion about P. Acceptance as a cognitive state is, I think, to be distinguished from what people call credence, so attaching a probability here well short of one, that P, that, that, I mean that P, but keeping alive and refusing to dismiss the possibility that not P. So credence is a kind of degree of belief. It's a matter of the strength of our belief, uh, which can, of course, should vary with the strength of our evidence. Now I, at least, would be less troubled by the fact that a person attaches a particular likelihood, say 0.3, to the possibility that I'm unintelligent, than if they take it for granted that I am, um, when a stereotyper has made up their mind about me based on a group generalization alone, I can feel like an insult, like a, an offensive thing for them to think about me. So, so what, if anything, might explain the legitimacy of that kind of grievance? Well, one answer is advanced by a number of philosophers has to do with how moral considerations bear on the kind and strength of evidence needed to adequately justify certain beliefs. So when the moral cost of error for believing a proposition are high, this can necessitate greater evidence in support of that proposition than when the moral stakes are low. So to put it slightly differently, when being wrong about a proposition could potentially wrong someone, you need a lot more evidence for the proposition than you otherwise would. If Ms. Johnson were to accept that one of her black students, let's call him James, has lower cognitive ability than his peers simply based on statistical data on race, racial differences in cognitive ability, then she's failed to give due weight to the possible moral cost of being wrong about James's intelligence. Now this is clearest when her belief threatens to spill over into action. Our beliefs can pose a danger to others given our disposition to act on our beliefs. It is, reasonable, it is a reasonable expectation that we refrain from relying on negative racial stereotypes when forming an opinion about an individual unless we have other strong supporting evidence. The cost of error here are sufficiently high that, say, suspending judgment on the proposition, that will be better. And given the proposition limited, if any credence typically will cost one little word nothing. So when feasible, we should try to gather further information about the individual before arriving, arriving at a firm conclusion about them. Now we might extend this point to demographic generalizations themselves, particularly racial generalizations. So some widely accepted racial generalizations are of uh, recent vintage, re recent vintage, I might say, like that black diners don't tip well. I don't actually know where that comes from, but it seems new. Others have a, a long and ugly history. These latter have a different moral significance because they carry a sort of freighted social meaning, like the belief that black men are rapists. 
Given the practical stakes, those subjects to these stereotypes understandably react with anger and great anxiety when they are assumed and invoked. The fact that certain race generalizations were used to justify practices like slavery or genocide and colonization, that's gonna be a reason to approach these generalizations with great caution and frankly, immense skepticism and to demand truly compelling evidence before accepting them. Note also that group generalizations that have served as rationalizations for grave injustices should give us immediate pause because they are so often grounded not in reason and evidence, but in objectionable non-cognitive motives. Unjust social arrangements encourage sub such beliefs among those who, have, who stand to benefit from those arrangements. And appreciation of the moral lessons of history, I think, should really just make us slow um, to form or retain beliefs of that sort. And there should just be a general presumption against your truth that only formidable evidence can overcome. When the moral stakes of our beliefs directly involve action, it is straightforward how moral considerations could and should affect how we consider the relevant evidence. For obvious reasons, by people, they don't want cops to stop or search or use physical force against them without adequate justification. Things are less clear, however, when the moral stakes are a matter of the content of the belief itself where the risk of moral error is actually in thinking of another in a way that one ought not. Should black people care from a moral point of view what a cop thinks of them if there is no threat that the cop will act against their interest? Now sometimes the content of another's belief disrespects us in a way that is dehumanizing or demeaning. For instance, we are each owed respect as persons, as self-conscious, rational, moral agents. When others fail to recognize that we are capable of reason and uh, autonomous action, um, they don't merely believe something that's false about us. Uh, I think they actually can be said to wrong us, even if they don't mistreat us in their actions. This, what some people call recognition respect, perhaps the minimum that we can ask of one another, is something all persons, regardless of the race, are entitled to. And this kind of respect was lacking when, for instance, many believed that black people were incapable of democratic self-government. Now, these kinds of beliefs were quite common during slavery and Jim Crow. They are, fortunately, um, rarer today. Contemporary racial stereotypes usually fall short of such deeply dehumanizing ideas they don't fail to acknowledge the rational agency of blacks as a group. More often what they do is suggest that the negative trait, say low intelligence, is more prevalent than in other groups. The trait isn't said to be present in all members of the group, and those who are said to have the negative disposition, whether laziness, irresponsibility, criminality, whatever, are still thought to have the basic capacity to act contrary to that disposition. Today, there are few who would maintain that black people are like non-rational animals, act only from habit or from instinct rather than from reflection and moral judgment. We often form beliefs about individuals that are unfavorable or unflattering toward them, including beliefs about their intelligence and their work ethic and tendency toward violence. So say we think that the person in the checkout lane is an asshole, that the passenger you sometimes see on the bus ride home is a dangerous individual, and that the neighbor's gardener is kind of creepy. Now we're of course sometimes mistaken, and maybe we're too quick to form a judgment about uh, the person's character. But these negative opinions don't in themselves seem to wrong these individuals. Beyond a certain minimum threshold, we can't reasonably demand on moral grounds that relative strangers not form unfavorable opinions of us. Now, we sometimes make similar negative judgments about groups, including groups so large that it isn't feasible to get to personally know every member. These judgments are sometimes morally benign, I think. So consider uh, these examples. Men are obsessed with sex. Capitalists are greedy. Politicians are dishonest. 
Now again, perhaps these generalizations on any reasonable interpretation are just false. They're inaccurate, they're misleading. They're unjustified given the evidence that we have available to us. But would accepting them be morally wrong? I'm sort of doubtful. But let's compare them to these familiar generalizations. Black people are impulsive. Women are emotional. Homeless people are lazy. Now, I think we all would agree that the B generalizations are more troubling than the A generalizations. <clears throat> Yet I don't think this is because it is wrong to regard a group as impulsive, emotional, or lazy, but permissible to regard it as sex-obsessed, greedy, or dishonest. So I think the trouble has to lie somewhere else. Both sets of generalizations are commonly held and epistemically flawed, I, I think, in addition to being unqualified and really frustratingly vague. But set B are about disadvantaged groups vulnerable to mistreatment. So while it might be morally permissible to hold a widely accepted but unwarranted negative opinion about a powerful group, such beliefs are much less defensible and possibly morally objectionable when they are about, say, an oppressed or disadvantaged group. These are groups that are already unjustly burdened in various ways, and I think we should just avoid adding to their burdens by being really quick to think ill of them. Our sense of justice and empathy for the marginalized should really make us just slow to form judgments of this sort. Certain types of relationships require those in them to regard each other, that is, to think of each other, in specific ways. The least of these relationships are to be good ones. I think this is clearest, as some philosophers have argued, in close personal relationships, whether these be familial relationships or marriage or friendship. Now, in the version of this view that I would defend, the norms governing close personal relationships, they require that we be charitable in our interpretations and assessments of our significant others. We should be disposed toward a favorable view of our children, spouses, and friends, especially of their abilities and character, making a special effort to see them in a positive light. In particular, and most relevant for our purposes, the demand is that we be reluctant to form a negative opinion of them. Such negative assessments should be formed only on only especially strong evidence, much stronger, I think, than we need uh, to be justified in forming opinions of this sort, negative opinions about strangers. Of course, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about anybody. We shouldn't be inclined to think the worst of anybody. But the kind of charity at issue goes beyond the ordinary goodwill or benefit or the doubt that each of us owes all other persons. These relationship norms do not require that those in them accept particular propositions about each other's um, abilities or character, nor do they forbid any specific opinions about one another's agential characteristics. It's permissible, I think, to come to a negative assessment of a loved one, but only slowly. After serious reflection and due consideration of the evidence, which should be strong, if not decisive. So I would not, as some people have said, uh, describe the disposition toward charity as a kind of epistemic bias or a kind of vice. I don't think it's an epistemically unjustified stance, and it doesn't require believing things on inadequate evidence. What one is doing is simply raising the evidentiary standard for coming to unfavorable conclusions. The threshold for acceptance here, full belief, is just higher for these unflatter unflattering judgments. The risk of error, in this case damage to uh, the relationship, is such that the standard for adequate evidence should be demanding. Charitable interpretations and assessments, just like a willingness to make sacrifices, these are really necessary ingredients in good close relationships. In the absence of this kind of charity, relationships are often marked by resentment or mistrust, mistrust if not dysfunction. We wrongly risk what makes each relationship special when we take a less than charitable view of those we love. Bonds are frayed when we are too quick to believe the worst of those we claim to care about. It's reasonable for our significant others to demand such charity from us, which I think is just another way of saying that we owe it to them. This norm governing beliefs in close personal relationships should be understood as a part of the ethics of belief. 
The normative requirement is really to cultivate and maintain certain charitable dispositions when forming and updating our beliefs about those with whom we have close ties. Now, if this line of thought is correct, then we might ask whether it holds lessons for race relations in the United States. One, person, one pertinent lesson is that how we should think of one another depends on the particular relations in which we stand to one another. The relationships between racial groups in American society are not, nor could they be, intimate or close relationships, which is not, of course, to say that there couldn't be close relationships between individuals from different racial groups. Of course they can. But such intergroup relations are considerably more impersonal. And the moral demands must accordingly be less exacting. Love and loyalty can't be expected. However, I think it's not unreasonable to expect goodwill and mutual respect, particularly among fellow citizens. And yet these are, sadly, often lacking between members of different racial groups. Racial relations, though improved from earlier eras, are still marked by too much mistrust, resentment, and recrimination. When relationships are sour, there's a tendency for those in them to think the worst of each other, to look for damning flaws. In such cases, even the benefit of the doubt normally accorded strangers is not extended. The different racial groups in US society cannot expect to develop or maintain a relationship characterized by goodwill and mutual respect if one or more groups are quick to form negative judgments about others, the others. The political ethics of belief have pertinence here and I think should be a component of any attempt to repair race relations in the United States. Now to be clear, I'm not calling for US race relations to be like friendship or familial love, though maybe that's an aspiration. But conscious charity and a high evidentiary standard are called for when considering generalizations about the abilities and dispositions of racial groups particularly when a negative assessment is a possibility. The political ethics of belief counsel restraint and careful thought before coming to a negative judgment because the moral risk of error is, among other things, continued or worsened racial division. Now, I think this kind of imperative applies to all racial groups. Those seeking racial reconciliation should, be, uh, should not be hasty when forming judgments about white people either for example, being swift to draw the conclusion that a white person is a racist. Yet, I think there are at least three relevant asymmetries that suggest that even greater care should be taken before accepting negative generalizations about black people and other stigmatized ethno-racial groups, and I'll mention them briefly as I close. First, as noted earlier, disadvantaged racial groups are still vulnerable to severe mistreatment because of their race. Negative stereotypes about them are among the unfair burdens they carry. One should take care not to needlessly add to this burden by making negative judgments about these groups. Some charity in the assessment of their abilities and character is called for to avoid increasing the weight of oppression for groups that are already confronting enduring injustice. Second, the most threatening racial stereotypes um, have often served to rationalize or justify maltreatment of such non-white groups. This fact alone, I think, should make us skeptical of the accuracy of these generalizations. Why? Well, the distortion of social reality has so often been the function of these beliefs. And finally, the racial stereotypes that are most widely held today support the idea that current racial disparities, whether these be in wealth, educational outcomes, employment, incarceration rates, and so on, that these disparities are the result not of historical or enduring injustice, but of the shortcomings of certain non-white groups. Because these generalizations support the conclusion that no further redress for racial injustice is needed, those who stand to gain from the racial status quo should suspect motivated reasoning in themselves. Accordingly, and in keeping with the political ethics of belief, I think they should give racial generalizations, these kind of racial generalizations, great scrutiny before accepting them. Racial stereotypes, uh, I think, really remain a, a, a very serious social problem and an unjust burden on those subject to them. 
the moral grounds for objecting to such stereotypes are, in fact, many. They can be objectionable not only for their predictable negative social consequences and their wrongful actions that are taken on their basis, but also, and this has been my main theme, because of how they are formed, how they are used, how they are held, what they reveal about the character and the sentiments of those who hold them and their demeaning propositional content. Racial stereotypes persist in part because many fail to observe the political ethics of belief. Robust fidelity to these norms, an ethos of civic responsibility regarding how we form and update our beliefs about matters of public concern, I think these norms are essential in a truly democratic society, and particularly in a multiracial one like our own. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Shelby. Um, it, so, uh, this was just like an awesome way to show the way in which philosophy can really make interesting interventions. So I really appreciate it in general. Um, but the question that I had was sort of related to the last part of your talk, which it seems like um, for some, well, for, it seems like there's two different ways in which like our evidence can be sort of, we could start thinking and reflecting on the standard of the evidence. And one is related to the sort of disempowerment or the power relationship between um, the target of the stereotype and the person sort of maintaining the beliefs. And the other was more related to um, the sort of fact that if you're in a position where you're actually benefiting potentially from the continuance of the stereotype, then that's evidence for you, re regardless of the sort of relationship between the other person, to like second guess or to be a little bit more um, thoughtful about maintaining that belief. And those things can both be happening, but I'm just wondering if there was a relationship between those two things and if you actually needed to have a relationship in some ways with the other person in order to be second guessing your own uh, vicious uh, beliefs. Thank you. Question. Um, so, I was trying to draw a, a general lesson from some work philosophers have been doing about um, the, how personal, interpersonal relationships, especially close ones, can affect what the evidentiary standard should be that we employ or, and, uh, and whether we need to raise the, the, the standard for coming to a negative conclusion and try to see if I could draw some lessons for that. So I was imagining that there, there are going to be cases where you have um, people who are fellow citizens, who are trying to live together make decisions together, figure out what the laws are going to be, they're all going to live under, and so on. And that's a kind of relationship, not the same as a close, intimate relationship. Um, but they might have some similar requirements, right? So, the, the, so in, in that case where there are some asymmetries in power, that's just going to be a further, uh, a further reason for one to uh, be reluctant to come to a negative conclusion about those who may have much less power, um, but also a reason as, a, as you're thinking through what you should believe, uh, you, we know that we're all subject to a host of, of biases. That now, that's now become more common. There are best-selling books about it and so on. We are familiar with this. That one of the biases that can be in play here is when you know, when you, when you, when you stand to to benefit from arrangements, uh, you know, as they are, or as or 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 as they could be, and the beliefs that you have, or you're inclined to accept, uh, seem to justify or warrant those arrangements, and that that could be a reason because you stand to benefit from it, a reason to to do a deeper reflection on why you might be inclined to, or quick, let's say, maybe too quick, <laughs> to accept the conclusion of a, certain, of a certain sort. So I was trying to sort of, sort of, 
So there's a relationship in the sense that um, uh, between the, 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 the considerations of power differential and these considerations of, 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 of bias, but I didn't mean to like, I wanted to keep them as distinct kinds of considerations. If I, am, I, am I being responsive to the question? Did I lose the person who asked the question? Oh, you're way back there. <laughs> okay, I'm looking in the wrong place, sorry. Am I following? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shelby, so much for the lecture. Um, we at our table in our two-minute thinking period uh, immediately uh, came to the implications of this if you're serious about uh, education for citizenship. Um, and I was wondering uh, specifically around these considerations about you know, our re relational responsibility in a democratic society about how um, we might uh, start expressing that uh, uh, in a teaching way to younger children or, uh, you know, how does that fit into the vision for education that we uh, might imagine? Too big for me, but I'll, I'll try to say, <laughs> to say something. Um, I mean, I, I think, so this, we can just focus, we can focus on, you know, K through 12, but we can go further, I suppose, but, um, you know, we think it's important to educate young people for lots of different reasons, right? There's no one, no one thing, right? So um, education is valuable in itself. It's good to be an educated person, opens up possibilities for you, gives you options, all kinds of things to make you a more interesting person. <laughs> um, uh, but we also, I, I think, many of us believe that part of the reason why we, we think it's so important and why we think we can draw on public funds to, to do it is because we think it's really critical that people developed um, uh, certain knowledge about themselves, the world, um, their society, and certain habits of mind so that they can participate in a democratic society. So I think that's part of, that's what partly justifies the, the money we spend and that we tax people for that money is that that's the, it's not just for the edification of, this, of the students, but rather we know that you can't really maintain a functioning democracy that's built on rational deliberation about what we should do, how we should live. If we don't have people who are equipped to engage in that. And so I think so I think that gives you an overall justification for why it's important to kind of cultivate these things. But also, if, if I'm right, that there, you know, we, we engage in this collective deliberation against a background of a, of a history, of a history of, of, of many uh, quite grave injustices that still reverberate now and still have effects now. Um, it's a very diverse society with people from lots of, have lots of different experiences in the world. And you know that's critical to that to be brought to bear as well in the educational context. And so part of what I want to emphasize here is is how you know when you put those two things together that you know that you know those I think legitimate educational goals with the importance of understanding that that history and our present um, that you can see why it's going to be critical to try as early as you can early and often as they say to kind of cultivate what I'm calling these kind of habits of mind, this kind of political ethics of belief. Um, and it can be difficult because, uh, especially in light of the fact that um, people are differently situated in the society, uh, some more advantaged than others, sometimes some things are, are zero sum or at least appear to be, and you're competing for things, and it can make it very tempting to, um, to come to very negative opinions about others who are competing for things that you'd like to have. <laughs> um, and so it, it's, it's hard work, I think, to try to get people to stand back from the range of, of biases, whether hot or cold biases, that can impact their thinking. Um, so I, I think that's the place, I think cultivating that early, getting people thinking about that early, and I think that certainly extends through into, into higher ed. But, um, uh, so that's kind of the, broadly the way I would think about how it's relevant. I'm sure you have much more specific, interesting things to say than I do, but that's the, the broad, the broad sweep. Hi, thanks for the talk. So I'm thinking about a variation of the Ms. Johnson case, and I want to know what your account says about it, uh, just in the way of clarification. So say that Ms. Johnson is a prioritarian, and so the fact that she holds this belief about her black students means that she is putting 
much more effort and resources toward their education, and she's encouraging others to do the same. So this belief she has is actually positively benefiting her students. So, so what would, how does it fit this model is what I'm curious about. Good. Um, so so part, the first thing I want to say is that there, so when you take, the, when you abstract a belief, so part, part I want to say that just having the belief itself about these racial differences, that doesn't seem in itself to wrong, to wrong anyone. So it, it, it can rise to the level, I think, of moral concern, often because of the way in which it's joined with other kinds of things. I, I take that as part of your point. So if you, if you join the belief with the thought that um, uh, the people of higher intelligence should get all the rewards in society and dominate the people who don't or something like that, or they're the ones who should get all the esteem, others not, then, then you can see why that would be terribly troubling. Um, if you joined it with other kinds of beliefs, you might think it'd be less, be less, be, be less troubling. So in the case you, you mentioned where they think, so I, I also wanted to, to, to separate out um, the acting on the belief which is already gonna raise other considerations, right? So once you kind of, once Ms. Johnson is, she doesn't just think it, she thinks that it's part of justification for how she treats the students. That's gonna immediately raise other questions about what should be the policy in this educational environment. Is this, is this an appropriate way for teachers to regard and interact with their students, thinking of it in, 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 in these ways? Um, uh, but mostly what I was wanted to emphasize were the things that people often think less about, which is about whether there's something um, troubling in the fact that she thinks it. And to try to, to I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that we're going to be immediately concerned when we start figuring out, trying to think about what she might do because she thinks it. I, I take it that straightforward. Everybody agrees. All kind of questions are going to arise. But, I was trying to figure out, is there something morally troubling about the fact that she just has the thought? And trying to figure out what that might be. So a lot of the discussion was to try to point to the ways in which you know, what's troubling are maybe, may lie elsewhere, may lie in how she uh, uh, comes to the belief, and whether she's come to the belief in an, in an ethically justifiable way. So that's, that's, that's most what I was trying to to emphasize, is that yeah, clarifying? Oops. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Shelby. Um, I was intrigued by your, um, about how your thoughts on ethics of beliefs, and I wanted to know had you applied that to any other area besides stereotypes? And I wanted to add, is it Johnson was your reference in there? Um, that there are many people who do think like that. And so I actually did like that reference that you made there. So I, I, I just want to know, did you, have you written any more um, about ethics of beliefs towards any other topics and articles or anything you might have? You know, I haven't really, I mean, I'm start, I'm, this comes out of a, a brief moment of intellectual biography. Um, it comes to the thinking about a range of questions about racism over the years, um, and um, the debates amongst philosophers about well, what's really most troubling about about racism. And I have been um, among people arguing that um, there can be a, that the, 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 the question of this of, of racial beliefs, beliefs about racial matters, put it like that, that those beliefs themselves. Um, uh, are can be in themselves racist, but I hadn't. But 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 and but but it sometimes can. What makes the thing racist and what makes the thing wrong might not be the the same. And so I've been arguing for something along these 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 lines. And and I wanted to step back a bit and think about. Well, let's just set that the question of racism to one side. Is there something just just wrong about people just believing these these things? Um, because some people do think that, that there is. And I think that they're sometimes mistaken because there, there's something that's wrong, but it lies someplace else, not necessarily in the, the, the mere acceptance of the belief. 
So this is what I was trying to, deepening in my own thinking about these questions, was trying to get to. But that's as far as I've really gotten, is to, is to try to say what I've, basically I've said to you uh, today. Um, there's a second part to, to your question. No, I was just um, making a statement about how I believe that your um, reference. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Um, Not, that was more and yes. And that yeah. reference, but yes. I thank you, thank you. No, I, I agree. Um, the case is, it's not a, a, a fancy philosopher's uh, made up case. It's, uh, it's, it's, these cases exist. Um, thank you for coming out and uh, doing this lecture. It's really been really interesting uh, so far. Um, uh, one of the things uh, I want to ask about is that um, talk a lot talked a lot about uh, belief and uh, kind of belief spurring action, and that's uh, in part of like what makes a belief um, or ha having that belief objectionable. Um, but I was wondering, um, what if uh, belief never, um, in, in, you know, for a person, what if it doesn't translate into an action, or like never translates? Or and the the second question to that is, is that even possible? Like we all like to think we're, you know, the masters of our, our own domain, but you know, as you talk about biases, so is it like even possible to uh, have belief and not have it some way reflect in you know your reality and how you interact with others? Yeah, yeah, that's a hard question. I mean, um, there are some philosophers who I think think of beliefs as, in part, um, dispositions to, to act. Um, um, and that might be the fact, the fact that, it, that it, it often is could be a consideration in how we uh, attend to the beliefs that we have, that we, we know that kind of once it kind of occupies the, uh, the kind of cognitive economy of the mind, as it were, that it's, um, uh, it, 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 it does pose a risk of showing itself in, in action or comportment or attitudes and, and, and so on. And, that, and I wouldn't want to deny that, that that can be, can, can be true. Uh, I'm kind of inclined, um, you know, for other kinds of reasons, to have how I think about moral agents, um, without getting too much into it, to be reluctant for us to approach our deliberation about what we should believe by um, um, I can see if I go this way I'm going to go on a tangent so I'm not going to do it <laughs> um, but so I agree with you that it's that that, that that is a concern that if because when we believe certain things they there, there is a suspicion to act, and that's going to be a worrisome thing. I don't know that it's true, kind of, how to put it, constitutively as a, a belief. I think we have beliefs about many things where, partly because there's no, um, no, no way to act on it, right? So we have beliefs, we have beliefs about, um, uh, you know, you know, in astronomy, for instance, we might have many, many kind of beliefs about the movement of celestial bodies that don't really impact anything. Nothing we're going to do is going to have any impact on it and so on. And I think there are other kinds of beliefs that are like that, um, that are kind of more abstract. They don't, uh, 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 it's not immediately clear what you would do with it. Sometimes you entertain a belief just because out of curiosity. And it's not, it's not a thing that's like a part of, it's not, it's not figuring deliberation at all, it's, you know. And, uh, and I think it's not um, ridiculous to think that there might be some beliefs in this, in this domain that are of that, of that sort, that, are, that, that come from that place. Um, yeah, and, and with those beliefs, would those beliefs still be objectionable if there's no way to act on them? Well, um, part of what I was trying to get at was to, to think about how, when they are, uh, some fall into the category I was describing as kind of demeaning um, beliefs. So I think there are certain things that if you think that of a person, if you think the person's like a, like a wild animal and they're a person, I think that's going to be a kind of wrongful way of regarding another, another person. And I think it's also going to be true that sometimes you're going to have beliefs um, because of how you 
come to acquire them or, or when you've been faced opportunities to rethink them, kind of how you approach those moments, how you approach the moments of deciding whether to accept it or what kind of credence to give it, whether you should just suspend belief on it, um, kind of how, so most of what I've been emphasizing is that it, it, it's more in the process of inquiry and reflection where the ethical considerations need to kind of come, come, come to bear Right uh, on, and it's less in the mere acceptance of the belief, because there might be under under certain conditions, it, it it might be acceptable to believe it because the evidence adequately supports it. Do you see what I'm suggesting? Yeah, that was the idea. Thank you. Hi, um, I've been instructed to let you know that I'm the last question. <laughs> um, so I got sick when I was hearing some of the racial slurs, and I wondered if you could reflect about how we as teachers or as students um, figure out ways of combating these things um, and also hold like the way in which talking about it is unpleasant. Is that like, you know, like some worry about like, yeah, I'd love to hear like how as a teacher or just as a scholar and a thinker, how do you think about um, that? That's hard. <laughs> um, um, so obviously, so I am, I shouldn't say obviously, so I am taking certain liberties and putting things in a kind of provocative way that I think I will assume that my audience will um, give me a certain latitude because um, I've got a track record, as um, Professor Thompson was happy to tell you about. Uh, I have a track record of writing, uh, writing about these things. Um, it's not the first thing I've ever spoken, <laughs> said about uh, race or black people, and so I spent a career doing this. Um, so I think, I think we have to kind of be aware of our People might say positionality a little bit. So, like, so I, you know, I, I, I because I have that track, that track record, and I think people will give me the benefit of the doubt. Um, uh, they're more willing to to not shut down if I say a thing that's very provocative or that might be offensive to to them, with, if they think there's some payoff in that. So, I think that's something that maybe people have to kind of earn to to be able to do that. I know some people think that no one should do it, but I think that's not right, I think we have to have spaces, some spaces where we can have kind of uncomfortable conversations about these questions and the spirit of trying to figure out what's the right thing to think. So I, I think that's gotta be true in, in, in higher education, that it has to be a space where we can uh, talk about these things in an uncomfortable way, in a forthright way, but hopefully respectful way, where we can have disagreement about it I think it's got to be a space. You know, would I do that on CNN? Probably not. Um, or certain kinds of spaces I, I, I might not, where I think it wouldn't be taken in the right spirit. Or, but I think there's got to be context, and this is a, among them, where we, we are able to have those kinds of conversations in a, in a really direct and forthright way. So I hope it was received as such. Well. On behalf of the Center for Ethics and Human Values and the Kerwin Institute, please join me in thanking our 2024 Distinguished Lecturer in Ethics, Professor Tommy Shelby. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for making it out. Uh, please visit the CEHB website to learn of more upcoming events. Uh, we look forward to hearing your voice in those conversations moving forward. As ever, thank you.